Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Hey, good evening, friends. Welcome to this Wednesday night, October 28, 2015 edition of Nightcast. Our opening story tonight, friends, relates very much to prophecy, to the third seal from the book of Revelation. Let's just take a very, well, I was going to say, let's take a very quick look at uh, the third seal on our chart here. And you can see, one, two, three over, it's a column with a black horse at the top, a number three, and a, a black bar there in the column to indicate that Revelation depicts this third seal as a black horse, which Jesus Christ described very simply in plain language in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 as famines or scarcity of food. He used the word limus for that. And in this opening story tonight, friends, it's exactly that which we hope this will help put you on your knees tonight in fulfillment of what Christ is asking us to do in Luke 21, verse 36, where he says, watch the events of these seals, pray about them from the bottom of your heart, and there's a promise. We'll talk about that promise later in the program. Let's cover what this fourth seal, I'm sorry, this third seal famine news story is about tonight. Four million, four million people in South Sudan are at risk of famine. I know I repeated that. I'm going to repeat it one more time. Hope, hope uh, your antennas go up very high. Four million people in South Sudan are at risk of famine, according to the United Nations. The UN is calling on all sides in the country's civil war to grant unrestricted access to aid agencies as they try to prevent the deaths of many children. Yalda Hakem from the BBC's Our World reports from a village in Kaldak in the remote east of South Sudan to see the impact of the fighting and the famine that it is produce producing. Grass, however you cook it, is not a meal. But it's all Regina and her six children have to eat. I saw hundreds eating grass and leaves in a village in Kaldak, a remote town in opposition-held territory in the east of South Sudan. Many fled here to escape the civil war. But Kaldak has been virtually flattened following a government offensive. There's no hospital, no school, no market, and precious little else. So Regina and her friends forage in the bush for something to eat. We've been reduced to the level of cattle, she says. There's very little or, or no nutritional value in this grass and, and these leaves. These people could actually uh, develop health problems with their liver and their kidneys if they consume this uh, over a long period of time. Some of these people have been eating grass and leaves for about six months. At this giant camp hundreds of miles to the west in oil-rich Unity State, 120,000 refugees are sheltering under UN protection. Here at least there is aid, but 30 children a week have been dying from malaria. All sides in the civil war are accused of terrible atrocities. Two million people have now been displaced by the violence. This man told me government forces and their militias massacred everyone in his village who was too old or too young to escape. <laughs> The government denies its troops have committed any crimes. A tentative ceasefire between President Salva Kiir and his rivals means some aid is at least getting to remote areas. But the situation is anything but stable, and aid agencies warn that without proper access, there's a very real danger of famine. 
And then in a story related to earthquakes, which let's go to our chart again just for a quick second. On the fourth column over, where you see a pale green horse at the top and then the word pale under the number four, that's rev- that's uh, to illustrate how Revelation is depicting the fourth seal as a pale horse. And on that pale horse, it has a rider whose name is Death. And Revelation says alongside that pale horse and its rider named Death accompanies Hades, hell, the grave, rides right alongside them. It's a big seal or horse of death. And Jesus Christ described the main characteristics of this fourth seal as loimus, meaning disease epidemics, pestilence, the plagues of Egypt. He also said that between the third seal and the fifth seal, there would be increasing seismus, seismic activity, commotions in the air, commotions on the ground, such as on the ground, such as earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, and and related to uh, and, and other th- commotions on the ground, uh, tsunamis, wildfires, floods, etc. Related to that one that the King James mentions and renders o- only as earthquakes, but it's actually more than that. But that relates to our our story from the news today with the follow-up rescue effort regarding the big earthquake that occurred the the other day, which has made uh, many people homeless. Monday's earthquake in Afghanistan and Pakistan, many of those who've been made homeless, you're going to hear in this report, could die from exposure. Thousands spent Tuesday night, last night, in near freezing temperatures people reluctant to go back inside for fear of aftershocks. Pakistan, uh, well, we've got more in this report uh, from Pakistan. We've got uh, Shazeb Jiliani in Pakistan and Shameh Khalil in Afghanistan reporting on the aid and rescue effort in those areas. This is really the key challenge here. When we spoke to the Minister of uh, Natural Disaster and Crisis Management, he says, we're getting there, we're trying to reach these areas. We have brought blankets and tents to some communities in the Badakhshan province. And of course, Badakhshan is where the epicenter of that earthquake is. But he did admit that accessibility is still the number one challenge for rescue workers and for aid agencies to get to the people that are stuck behind these landslides, behind these uh, big, big rocks and mountainous areas and who are completely exposed to the harsh cold of these northern areas. And it seems that with the pace of things going, they'll have to spend another night in the cold, which means that the death uh, the death toll, the fatalities are going to rise. Unfortunately, children especially are pretty vulnerable. And of course, then there are the security issues. The Taliban militants are said to be in some districts in these provinces. And even though they gave assurances that they won't hinder help, no one can tell you for 100 percent of these areas are safe for aid workers to operate in if they get there. Back to that in a moment if we've got time. But um, Shazeb, you have made quite a trek out into the more remote parts, of course, in in Pakistan, this is. Uh, And what have you uh, encountered? Uh, David, we were in Mingora, uh, the main city in Swat Valley last night. This morning, we've driven about five hours to reach uh, a remote mountainous location in uh, district Shangla. Uh, This district was worst affected in this earthquake. At least 50 deaths were reported from this particular region. And if you look behind me, the village right there, Uh, has about 150 uh, houses there. Uh, Most of the concrete houses are still standing. Uh, There were five mud brick houses which collapsed in that particular village and two deaths were reported. And I think it kind of shows the overall picture as well that that there are a lot of people who are traumatized, who are fearful, um, hundreds of people hurt. Uh, But the scale of this disaster, uh, it now seems to me from what we have seen uh, since yesterday, uh, is not uh, as bad as was initially feared. Okay. 
And friends, Austria plans Slovenia border fence. The caption with this photograph, the first in this story I'm going to read to you here, says tens of thousands of migrants have poured into Slovenia in the past 10 days. And Austria has said it is planning to construct a fence at the main border crossing used by migrants entering the country from Slovenia. Austrian Chancellor Warner Feynman said the move would not shut the border, but would allow better control of arrivals. It came as Germany said it expected the number of deportations of failed asylum seekers to rise. Meanwhile, at least three migrants drowned and 242 were saved when a boat sank off the Greek island of Lesbos. We do not have a picture of how many people may be missing yet, a Greek Coast Guard spokesman said. Earlier, three migrant boats were reported to have capsized between Turkey and the Greek islands amid worsening weather in the area. BBC correspondent Damian Grammaticus says Austria and Germany, the two countries at the heart of Europe's refugee crisis, seem to be toughening their tone. They appear to be trying to deter refugees from setting out on their journeys and to head off political critics at home, he adds. The UN estimates more than 700,000 migrants have crossed to Europe by boat so far this year, mainly from war-ravaged Syria. The approach of winter has so far done little to slow the flow. Came after Slovenia said it could erect a fence along the border with Croatia if an EU plan agreed to on Sunday, three days ago, was not implemented. It follows suggestions from Serbia, Romania, and Bulgaria that they might begin building their own barriers. Some 85,000 refugees have poured into, into Slovenia in the last 10 days. You can see the main migrant route to Germany from Turkey on this map. Now, during the last 10 days, uh, in the last 10 days after Hungary closed its border with Croatia, on Sunday, 11 EU states and three non-EU countries agreed to set up reception centers with another 50,000 spaces in Bal Balkan countries and send 400 guards to assist Slovenia within a week. But EU members have previously been slow to deliver on pledges of such assistance. If the situation worsens and the Brussels action plan is not fulfilled, then Slovenia has several scenarios prepared, including the installation of a fence, of a fence guarded by forces, said Slovenian Foreign Minister Karl Erzjavik. Hungary has already fenced off its border with Serbia and Croatia, so such a move in theory means sealing off that route entirely. Now, there's a video we weren't able to um, get the full licensing on before airtime. Um, we'll try to have that tomorrow evening because it's quite interesting with the guitars and everything. The caption on this photograph, though, reads... The UN estimates more than 700,000 migrants have crossed to Europe by boat so far this year, mainly from war-ravaged Syria. A little more in this news story, friends. Following a cabinet meeting, in Austria's chancellor said a series of barriers would be erected at the Spielfeld border crossing with Slovenia, where several thousand migrants have been arriving every day. 
The barriers would improve security, he said, but would be nothing like the hundreds of miles of razor wire fencing Hungary has put up along the length of its frontier. We want to be able to carry out controls on people, and for, and for that, one needs certain technical security measures, he told reporters. However, in a joint statement later, Mr. Feynman and European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker said, Fences have no place in Europe. Fences have no place in Europe. President Juncker called on Chancellor Feynman to work closely together with the Commission and UNHCR to ensure that the 50,000 objective is reached as soon as possible, including by means of an Austrian contribution, the joint statement said. Germany's interior minister, Thomas de Mazier, has accused Austria of transporting refugees to the German frontier at night, leaving them unannounced. He warned that Germany would start to deport more people who didn't qualify for asylum and described as, quote, unacceptable the fact that Afghans now made up the second largest source of arrivals in Germany. Large amounts of aid had been spent in Afghanistan, Mr. De, de Mazier said, and Afghans should stay in their country, end quote. You know, um, we I've been showing you several nights in a row scriptures from the Bible that show how God sets the bounds of people. And it even says he's done that according to the number of the offspring of Israel. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll be putting that slide and some others up again. I want to go on to the next story, though tonight, friends, because this one relates to some things I have to do after we get off the air tonight as people disregard certain press freedoms. The press freedom in Turkey is a major concern, is the headline for this news story. After the inconclusive parliamentary elections in June, Turkey is once again going to the polls this coming Sunday. The country faces a series of challenges, increasing attacks from so-called Islamic State, violence with Kurdish militants, and the financial burden of the Syrian refugees. To add to these concerns, there's also the issue of press freedom, although the government says Turkish journalism is one of the freest in the world. The BBC's Salen Gurit reports. Turkey is gearing up for another crucial parliamentary elections, and press freedom remains to be a major concern. Here are the offices of the Prokurdish Dijle News Agency. This building was raided by the police last month, and over 30 journalists were detained. In another incident, one of this agency's cameramen was threatened by the police. Holding a gun to his head, he was shouting, when I say stop filming, stop filming. The state does not think very highly of us. They regard us as if we are terrorists. When there were a record number of imprisoned journalists, they used to say, these people are not journalists. They are not imprisoned because of their journalism. But it's not only Kurdish journalists who say they're coming under increasing pressure. Last month, one of Turkey's most widely read newspapers was attacked by a pro-government mob. Later, one of their columnists was severely beaten. His nose and ribs were broken. The government also tried to stop journalists from reporting on certain issues, like the recent Ankara bombings, the deadliest ever attack on Turkish soil. International news organizations say these are all alarming moves to silence media in Turkey. The government, though, says journalism here is one of the freest in the world. Hey, friends, that's it for our report tonight, Wednesday night. God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again tomorrow night, Thursday night. 
But as we go off tonight, I want to give you just a quick reminder that this weekend it'll be time to turn back your clocks. When you go to bed Saturday night, in the kind of the middle of the night, early morning after midnight, when it becomes 2 a.m. in the morning, technically you roll back your clocks to 1 o'clock. Of course, you can do that before you go to bed Saturday night, or you can do it first thing Sunday morning when you get up, um, just as long as you remember to do it before you head out the door and miss any appointments that you might have had that day for a certain time. But uh, again, that occurs this Saturday night, just to announce that here so you get a little bit of advance warning of what's coming up this weekend. We fall back is the way they put it. All right, friends, again, that's it for this Thursday night for Nightcast. God willing, and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again. What did I say? That's it for this Wednesday night edition of Nightcast. God willing, and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again tomorrow night, Thursday night, with the day's current news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. Until next time, this is your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, saying so long and good night, friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.